And is public outrage over unemployment reaching critical mass as it spreads around the country as these protests are now popping up in uh, cities in Atlanta and in Minnesota, Washington, D.C.? What are the implications for politics and for public policy? MSNBC's Rachel Maddow, host of The Rachel Maddow Show, is live with us in New York. Rachel, you've been out there. You've talked to people. You've been doing interviews on this subject. Uh, how do you figure out what this really means? Is this a tipping point in our country? Is this Greece? Is this something uniquely American? You know, I, Andrea, it's interesting. I think the protesters have taken so much heat for not having a, a clear organizational structure, for not um, being a, a organized like a typical pressure group, for not having a tidy list of demands. But they've been very clear that that's on purpose. And there is a sort of genius to it, because by remaining a sort of inchoate angry but not very specific force, they are allowing everybody else in the country who is frustrated with Wall Street and the current state of the economy uh, to sort of project what they think is important onto those protesters. And so everybody who is mad that Wall Street torpedoed the economy and the rest of the country is still sunk while Wall Street is now doing fine and actually still doing some things to really gouge the middle class, everybody mad about that can sort of project that feeling onto those protests. It'll be interesting to see if they grow, but I think they're an important signifier even if they don't grow really is a Rorschach test for all the anger and the frustration for people who are angry at Washington for the way the debt ceiling crisis in August seemed to really exacerbate that, according to all of the polling and just anecdotally. Uh, this is the way the president and then the vice president reacted to the Wall Street protests. I'm curious, let's play it. I'm curious as to whether you think they've really captured the importance of what is happening out there. People are frustrated and, you know, the, the, the protesters... Uh, are giving voice to a more broad-based frustration about how our financial system works. The Tea Party started, why? TARP. They thought it was unfair. We we're bailing out the big guys. What are the people up there on the other end of the political spectrum saying the same thing? I'm not quite sure what Joe Biden was trying to do, maybe sort of lasso the, the passion of these protesters and bring them into the Democratic campaign fold, as the Tea Party has certainly energized Republicans. Interesting analogy. Well, it's, you know, it's, you look back at the start of the modern Tea Party movement, and a lot of different groups have called themselves, have used the Tea Party as a sort of uh, uh, an, an analogous reference point, right? The, the Ron Paul type protesters, for example, were using it long before uh, 2009. But when Rick Santelli got on the uh, floor of the stock exchange and started right. ranting about the bailout, he wasn't talking about being angry about TARP. He was talking about the proposed bailout of individual homeowners getting bailed out from having underwater mortgages because the mortgage system was rigged by the financial industry. That was the supposed call from the stock exchange uh, for being, and, and it was a call from traders who were angry that regular Americans might get bailed out. They were delighted that the banks got bailed out. So the, the Tea Party, again, in being sort of disorganized, has allowed people to project a lot of different things on it, a lot of different frustrations. And the lack of organization, the lack of clarity is a useful thing because it allows people to use it to, as a prism for all sorts of different uh, forms of anger. And I think that President Obama and President Biden, in talking about it recently, have been trying to say, you know what, if you are mad about the economy, there's a reason for it. You're not crazy. We're mad about the economy, too. And we are taking on Wall Street. We are taking on big business interests. And the Republicans are siding with them. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an unfocused message, but that allows people to use it for all sorts of different purposes. There's a genius in that, too. Yeah. Uh, now, let's talk a minute about Elizabeth, Brown, Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown and the Massachusetts race because they've gotten into a dust-up. Let's play a little bit of the original tape where she was asked about, uh, about Scott Brown and he, re he responded. To help pay for his, call, his law school education, Scott Brown po posed for Cosmo. How did you pay for your college education? I, I kept my clothes on. <laughs> Have you officially uh, responded to Elizabeth Warren's comment about how she didn't take her clothes off? <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Now, he's really taken a lot of heat for that comment, uh, for the alleged sexism in it. What is your take on this exchange and what it tells us about this race? It's certainly going to be one of the more entertaining Senate races. It is. Um, I live in Massachusetts, and so I'm fascinated by this anyway, just as a Massachusetts resident. Um, Massachusetts has one woman in the congressional delegation. They've elected basically z almost zero women over the life of the Commonwealth. Massachusetts voters uh, don't like to put send women to D.C. for some reason. And so uh, I don't know why that is, but that's that there, there's already an uphill battle there for Elizabeth 
Elizabeth Warren. But Scott, War Scott Brown uh, making a comment like that, uh, particularly with the radio host sort of, you know, chortling into his beer belly over it afterwards <laughs> in order to uh, really, really put the sexist point on it, um, I, I think might, may, have the, may have the effect of, of rallying women voters to Elizabeth Warren's cause. I mean, listen, the reason that it was a uh, when George Allen said the macaca thing back when he was running, uh, right. why that was a, a, the macaca moment lived on for a long time is because it tapped into people's worries about sort of racially charged things in George Allen's past. Had he not had uh, experience or people, things in his past, like a noose in his law office and stuff, where people thought there were racially charged thing about George Allen, that macaca thing would have just seemed strange. Similarly with Scott Brown, this might have just seemed like a, a, a joke gone wrong and a joke in the wrong context, but he's got a lot of social conservative, uh, socially conservative and sort of anti-woman's rights uh, things in his past that this taps into and sort of reminds you of and gives it sort of a creep factor. And the war in Afghanistan, I wanted to ask you about that. You've spent so much time there. Ten years later, we're talking about uh, more than 14,000 U.S. troops wounded, $338 billion, uh, the death toll extraordinary. What do we say about this? 1,687 men and women killed. Andrea, I feel like, you know, this it's a, it's this is the fact that this is 10 years now into this war ought to be a time for reflection. I mean, start starting wars politically is is hard to do in this country. It's maybe not as hard as it ought to be, but it's hard to do. It turns out that ending wars is politically even harder. And um, at this point, the divorce between civilian American experience and what we have put the military through, what mil the men and women of our military and their families have been through over the past decade, that chasm, that distance, um, is unprecedented in American history. We have never before had the military living such different lives for so long than the rest of the country. That is unprecedented and that is new. And I think it's a real moral liability uh, for our country as well as being a political liability. And I think it really, on this date, deserves some debate and some attention. I mean, the volunteer army had a lot of virtues until we were in two prolonged wars and repeated deployments, five and six deployments for some of these men and women. And we're talking about families that are being broken up and post-traumatic stress. Um, the profound distance between those of us who are contributing, th those of them, I should say, who are contributing and the rest of us who are not is just a huge gap. It is a huge gap to have the to have the American domestic economic reaction to starting that second war, to starting the Iraq war while we were still staying in Afghanistan. The next big policy thing that happened after we started that second war was that we took a second round of tax cuts. There is something wrong with a country that believes that the way to respond to starting a second simultaneous war is to make sure that American civilians feel like they are going to be paying even less for it. That is a that that is a that's a moral problem. I think it also sets us up actually for a situation in which we don't get out of our wars easily, and we we don't get out of our wars that we start, and we and we maybe start too many of them because we don't acutely, as civilians, feel the cost of who's going to be on the front line doing it. Troops and their families have lived such a different life, such a different life for the past decade than your typical American civilian family. Um, that 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 distance um, deserves questioning, deserves some interrogation. Rachel Maddow, who's been out there reporting on all of this from the beginning. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thanks Thank for you, coming Andrew. in. For sure. And, of course, Rachel's program tonight at 9 o'clock and every night on MSNBC.